<laughs> Lovely. So we are live in five. We're very alive. There are all five of us here and we're very, very excited. We've been having a lovely chat prior to this. So welcome. Welcome to this coffee session. The Time of the Writer, the 25th version of The Time of the Writer, which is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's really a silver, a silver experience that we're all going to have. And as you probably know, if you've been devotees of the festival, you'll know that for this year, the, the theme is beyond words. And those particular words are memory, imagination and conscience. And as I looked at those words, I thought, oh, my goodness, there's a, there's a book in each and every one of those words, there's a whole library full of um, books. But our discussion right now, our discussion over the next hour, our key words are imagination, success and recognition which are quite difficult words. In fact, Dikeng described a couple of them as slippery. So we're going to slip into this conversation and we're just gonna slide our way through it and see which direction it takes. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them up and we'll try and address your questions. So interesting about our panelists, we have four very wonderful, very erudite panelists, each and every one of whom is a storyteller, but I'm thinking possibly a writer or an author is a storyteller by the very nature of what they do. But they do all have a sort of bent towards storytelling, which in itself is interesting. So let me introduce you to them in alphabetical order so nobody feels left out or shortchanged that they come last. I'm gonna start with Garth, Garth Jaffet. I hope I pronounced that right. Is that right, Garth Jaffet? Okay, Garth Jaffet is a trained doctor. So if you're not feeling well, he's the man to speak to. But following his own challenges, he discovered the essential healing power of stories. And he went on to change tack to become the co-founder of Soul City, that was back in 1992, which has been described as a multimedia edutainment platform with health and social justice messaging. We'll get back to messaging just now. And this was followed sometime later in 2002 by Heartlines. His personal passion is to transform lives through storytelling and entrenching positive values. And his book, he claims not to be a writer or an author really, nonetheless, he has written a book and his book is called Life uh, Like Water is for Fish. And it describes that journey that I've just mentioned there. So hi Garth, lovely to have you with us as a non-author, but we'll see about that. I, I suspect that actually there are many more stories in you. Moving on to Lidudu Malingani Mkumboti, uh, who is primarily a writer, though he's also a secret poet, I think. He's a filmmaker, photographer. He's from the Eastern Cape originally. He won the Kane Prize for African writing back in 2016 with his stories, Memories We Lost. He's also the recipient of the Miles Moreland Scholarship for his debut novel, Let Your Children Name Themselves, which we have yet to see on the shelves, but looking forward. Um, he writes the Johannesburg Review of Books and he's the curator of the Berlin African Book Festival uh, with a focus in South African literature. Hi there, nice to have you with us. And he's sitting behind a very, um, very impressive looking collection of books, which he tells me are not his own, but you never know one day they might well be. So moving on to Lynn, the next L in our panelists, Lynn Joffe is the CEO of Creatrix, Cre Creatrix? Creatrix. Creatrix, uh, which is a multilingual storytelling agency creating and producing branded content and behavior change campaigns in 11 mother tongue in languages. She's done many word focused jobs. She's been a copywriter, scriptwriter, short stories, children's books. She gives master classes. If you're not seeing any hats she's wearing it's because they're all hanging up on a peg somewhere. She's also done her MA in creative writing, the result of which was her rather wild debut novel, The Gospel According to Wanda, which became a bit of a hit. Um, she's also written and performed a 13 part TV jazz series called Bejazzled, which gives her not some small thing in common with Ntikeng, Ntikeng Mokhlele, who is a South African novelist who I happen to know has a bit of particular interest in jazz. Am I right, Ntikeng? Correct. Yep, indeed. yep, yep, yep. We're getting a nod there. But he is, I, I want to I want to use the word prolific. I, I feel you're, you're prolific in King. Your titles include Michael K, which was a rewriting of Jane Kutzia, Life and Times of Michael K. Rather cheeky on that. The Scent of Bliss, Small Things, Rusty Bells, Pleasure, Illumination. And his most recent recent book, which I have yet to read, but I'm looking forward to, is a series of short stories called The Discovery of Love. 
So of all our panelists, I think Nji King is the one who has pushed out most babies into the world, if that would be the right analogy for a guy. Um, so he would probably have much to tell us. He also, interestingly, studied dramatic art and African literature. So I feel he's got lots to tell us. So um, as I say, I think each and every one of you come with, with a different portfolio of, of interests and on all sorts of things. But, you know, I, looking at the theme words for the, the time of the writer, you know, I thought, oh my goodness me, there's such a pressure on a writer to do all sorts of things. You know, the words of the, that are the theme of the festival, memory, imagination, and conscience. It feels to me like a writer is, is, being, um, is being persuaded to be an archivist of memories, to be a stretchers of imagination and defenders of human rights and rights against wrongs, as if it weren't already difficult enough to be a writer. There are all these things that are demanded or expected of you, or maybe not. So I think, um, I think my first question is, let's, let's look at the words that we've been given with today to, to work with. And I think I also want to start with, you know, let's start with a piece of writing, whether it's a bit of copy, whether it's a children's book, whether it's a novel, short story, a poem, whatever it is. What is the motivating factor? When you start a piece of writing and you sit down, you roll up your sleeves, fingers on the keyboard, what is motivating you to do that? Now, Ledudu Malingani, I am going to start with you because you threatened not to be saying anything. So I'm going to put you right in the hot seat. What motivates you to write anything at all? Unmute yourself, there you are. Uh, good afternoon to everyone watching this. And uh, it's good to be back at the uh, time of the writer. It's good to be amongst the authors on this panel. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's a couple of reasons why I, I write. Uh, one of them is, is that I chose to, to be a writer and I need to somehow practice it every other day uh, or else I would be wasting my life. But mostly I, I think I, I, I also write because I think there's, I mean, you know, I think any writer, there's a certain kind of stories that stay with you and demand that you tell them. And so you can spend all your time trying to run away from them, but there's a certain point where you actually need to sit and write. And part of the things, all the things that I've written are things that I've been thinking about for a very long time before I write them. So I think for me, it's usually the fact that I've been thinking about this thing for so long and I've read all these other books and I've looked at photographs, which are a great inspiration for me. And I've looked at films, which are, are secondary to photographs. And I absolutely have to write it. And, and that's part of why I, I write anything. It's because I, because I have to, because I need to. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a really good answer. Um, there are two parts to your answer. One is that you chose to be a writer where you could have done all sorts of other things and you have done a number of other things. You chose to be a writer but it feels almost like maybe you didn't have a choice because the stories were knocking at your door, waiting to be told. So although you chose to be a writer, it feels like maybe you didn't have such a choice. I mean, I, th I think once you open the door to those stories, then you have problems. But if you can keep the door shut and not entertain that you need to write them, maybe you can survive without writing them. So I opened the door and now it's too late to close it. I'm not sure that opening the door brings the problems. I think leaving the door closed might give you more sort of internal stress and strain and you would then, you would seriously need therapy. Ndi King, what, what's your take on what Lidudu Malingani had to say? Because do you, did you choose to write? Was that something you chose to do? Certainly as somebody who studied African literature, dramatic art, it feels like you might also have chosen to be a writer. Is that what motivates you? Uh, yes, ma'am, I would, I, would, I would agree. 100% with Ledudu, um, but for me, it's, um, it's more an instinct of immersion uh, where because of love of story and narrative, uh, from whatever angle you think of in visual arts, in motion pictures, in poetry, uh, any written word um, for that matter, um, I thought that I wouldn't want to be at an end where I 
am just a consumer of things. So for me, there was a motivation to actually be an active participation in the creation process of, 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 of things. And I think maybe that's a personality disorder because when the way I interact with the world is I want to break it down and to be able to do things for myself and to um, actually reflect in any area that is within my cognitive abilities and my abilities uh, from a talent point of view. Hmm. Um, do you agree with Lududu's statement about once you've opened the door to the stories that it brings you problems? Uh, yes, I think that statement is very apt because, you know, once the, the door is open, you really need to interact with whatever um, the characters need, need to, to, to uh, um, come to pass, as it were. So um, then th there's a lot of investment of, of, of time, of your ideas, and the writing process comes with more problems than solutions. So I think that his description is, is very accurate. Mm. It's a bit like, I'm just thinking of your latest book, which is called The Discovery of Love. It's a bit like a, a lover. You know, you have to have the lover, but the lover comes with all sorts of issues and problems that right. need to be dealt with. And I have the feeling, having read a number of your books, that you are a lover of words, um, a lover of all sorts of things, of jazz, of all sorts of things, but also of words. It feels to me like it would be very difficult for you not to write, because what would you do with that, with that love affair that you have? Um, yeah, response I, I, there? Yeah, no, I think very briefly, um, I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't work uh, with stories at some, you know, um, psychological, sociological, and, you know, personal uh, level. Uh, okay. But, but um, having said that, I think there's a tendency to also over-dramatize the importance of things that we do just because they are dear to us. Um, for a mother who is a pregnant lady in the Ukraine in a bombed hospital, uh, my sentiments about writing would be very relevant, I would think. Would they? I mean, the very fact that you've mentioned such a thing, uh, you know, the whole Ukraine, I keep thinking to myself with this whole Ukraine horror, there are going to be so many stories that already are. We, the television is flooded with the stories. Radio is flooded with the stories. But eventually there are going to be so many books and stories and poems, if indeed there aren't already, that are coming out of it. I mean, the very fact that you mention it already, you've conjured a picture. So you've opened the door. Um, yes, I have. But I think that I'm, I mean it from a sense of, um, yes, it's important in terms of... Um, priority uh, in life. Uh, I think it's nice when there is a social equilibrium and things are working well, which they never do in the world, um, to you know pontificate about books and writing and art and what have you, but there are more weightier and more fundamental um, you know, uh, precepts in the world. Um, and if you look at a state of war, there's a loss of humanity up to a point that, you know, uh, the discussion of syntax and commas and, you know, brilliant prose, it's important to bring the stories out and to do a recording of history and what have you. But in the throes of conflict and that level of uncertainty and, you know, the world, uh, not to be over dramatic, being on the brink of annihilation, uh, of what good is, 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 is appraising good prose? Well, that comes back to the word that we, we may, hopefully we will get to is conscience, um, because maybe your conscience is, it, it will give, because you're a writer, you are in a position to write that, which may open other people's minds. You might be writing it from the point of view of the pregnant woman. You might be writing it from the point of view, God help us, of Vladimir Putin. You know, it depends whose point of view you're putting across, and then that becomes your your opportunity to change people's minds. But listen, we're going we're going into um, a different a different realm here. But very interesting thoughts there. Thanks very much, Nita King. Um, but I think that there is a personal opinion nothing worthless about writing. I think there there is so much to be said, and I think the craft of writing is a whole nother story. Um,
Garth, let's go to you. What is your feeling? What is? I know that you've only written the one book, but you have, as somebody who works with stories, helping other people craft their stories, what for you motivates storytelling? Let's call it storytelling as opposed to just writing. Well, I actually just want to respond to uh, into Kang's point. Um, and, and although we're talking about writing, um, you know, I wrote because I wanted to talk about the power of story. Uh, and one of the key motivators was around a campaign that we were running called What's Your Story, which uh, we produced a film called Beyond the River. Uh, it was, you know, just this concept that when I get to know your story, you become human to me. And ultimately, uh, although we may look different, we may speak different languages, we may be of different genders, um, when we get to know each other's stories are uh, sort of stereotypes of what the other person is falls away. So, you know, in an increasingly divided world, um, you know, whether it is in Africa or in, you know, we've got the conflict in Ukraine, but we've also got conflicts in Ethiopia. We've got conflicts in the Central African Republic. We've got conflicts between Muslims and other, other faiths. Um, so, so part of my motivation to write uh, this book was part of a broader motivation, which is to um, do three things, really, which is to encourage people to get to know each other's stories, um, to, to do that first. And I did it through narrative, um, my own narrative. The other was to just awaken people's um, sort of minds to the power of story. Uh, talking about imagination, my trajectory as an unlikely doctor was essentially sparked by a series of books written in the 1950s, which captured my imagination in the 70s, led me to becoming a doctor in the 80s. Um, and then the third thing is, is getting to grips with your own story and, and about writing down your own story and about how that leads to, to healing. So Ultimately, you know, those were my inspirations. So my, I d didn't uh, like, like my colleagues here have a, a book burning in me or stories, but I had an objective um, and felt that you don't write a book about story if you don't tell stories. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that was the, the, the sort of mo mobilizing thought for, for my book. Yes, I like the distinction between the objective and the motivation, because they are, they're quite different. The objective is there's a very distinct um, goal, whereas a motivation, it's more of a, it's more amorphous. Um, and I, I'm very pleased that you brought up the issue of, you know, because looking at, as a writer, telling other people's stories, but there's some, the benefit for the person telling their story is that in writing their own story, they come to grips with their story, they make sense of it, and they make sense of their lives, which is exactly, really what you do and I just quickly whilst we're on that did you find that writing your story like water is for fish did you find it um helpful therapeutic if I can did, did it make help you make sense of your journey well I'd already done uh, some of that work which was you know to to backtrack and try and understand my motivations um and, and so sort of rewriting what I'd already been through um obviously was useful um but yeah, I mean, I must say, I take my hat off to people who make, who do this as a, as a living, because it's, I'd far rather be in a casualty with gunshot wounds and, uh, and than have to make my living as a writer. Uh, it certainly was one of the, the hardest things I've done. And just to pay credit to an extraordinary editor in Alison Lowry, she, there would be no book without an amazing editor. And so in my case, it was, you know, just, you know, understanding that, in fact, it's almost a team sport. Uh, writing is to have people encouraging you and saying, actually, what you think is really, really, to quote an old Irish phrase, crap, uh, is, is actually not, you know, just saying, hey, keep on going. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm sure there will be a lot of people nodding their heads. It is no easy ride writing a story. In fact, I take my hat off to every writer that's out there who's for author, writer, who's produced books, I just think, because it's such a journey. And it, it's, not, it's not just a team sport. I think it, what's the expression? It takes a village. It takes a whole city sometimes. 
to write a book. And I, I'm thinking about, you know, how you told your story in that book, but Nti Keng Lidudu would be telling other people's stories. And I suppose in telling other people's stories, you're still telling your own story because you can't get away from you. You are in, in every word you write one way or another. Lynn, what, I, I'm not sure, the question has now sort of become a bit, it's moved on since I began, but let's go with what, what motivated you. Did you have an objective that I want to write a novel? What motivated you? Because you've been writing in all sorts of guises for a very long time. Why? Thanks, Nancy. Well, so so I've been told I've been telling stories since I came out the womb, you know, from what I did today to my mommy, to singing, to cabaret, to TV, to very much similar to what Garth has, has been doing in terms of encouraging others to tell their story. And in fact, I, I'm no baby. Um, I needed the structure and discipline of, a, of, an, of an MA. Um, it's interesting what, what Garth said about it takes a village because I think I discovered my introvert. I think the reason it took me so long for the writer to become me, if I can use that cliche, I didn't become a writer, a writer became me through the process of saying it's time. I didn't know what exactly it was that I wanted to say. So I discovered what I wanted to say while I was doing it. And in fact, I mean, I'm not just a bit of self-promotion is that one of my MA um, Oaks that was with me said, he said to me, you misspelt memoir. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this isn't a novel. This is the story of your life which it isn't, but it's based on. And, and for me, the exciting thing to get back to what Ledu and the other guys were saying, it was that discovering who I was through writing, but not writing about me and, and starting to write. In fact, I had originally intended it to be memoir and then wonder, I mean, always say, you know, Wanda just arrived one day in, on my lap, she didn't. There was a transformation, almost alchemical process, which isn't the same as, for example, behavior change for Anglo-American to make, um, people happy about the mining industry or, or, or the medical industry. It was it was a very lone journey with a lot of people. Alison was also my editor. Um, after the MA, it took us two years to tear it apart and put it together and tear it up. It's absolutely essential. But I think that in my, um, I've got a theory about women in the baby raising sort of from 15 to 50, you're taking care of everyone else. And it was almost by going through menopause that the, that the children started stories started pouring out and it was now time to, to, to be egotistical, if you like, although it's more about self than ego, to do this myself, to find out who myself was. And, and that's, um, they also say value is the soul of storytelling. It's one of those um, kind of commercial cliches. But what was I writing about? I could only discover while I was writing it. There wasn't a, an intention to write this book, but the intention came with the writing. That makes sense. If that book is you, you are considerably older than you look. Um, which is, <laughs> Don't you think the Botox has worked so well? Uh, but, but just quickly, what's interesting about that was that my life story is very interesting and I can regale you with all of the things that have happened to me, but writing through the, the guise of a character, I'm sure that other guys have got uh, an opinion about this. Wanda B. Lazarus is not me. She is the medium in which I can describe, if you want to call it my feminist stance, which I don't want to push on anyone. And in fact, Alison and I had a, had a huge fight about, we cannot say the word patriarchy once in this entire book, although that's what the whole book's about. And I love I loved the idea for me that in, my, in expropriating my own culture, because I've discovered how, how very much Jewish one can actually be without having to go behind the veil, um, you know, ignored by all men, um, to actually discover who I was through the message that the book does convey, not just to my people, but in a more universal sense, I hope. I'm going to try with some difficulty to pull, pull in the reins and go back to where we were, what we were supposed to be talking about. I just couldn't resist finding out the motivation, what got everybody writing, why you were doing it. So we've got three words here. Imagination is the first word, which is, it's a very loose word. It too is slippery into king, but let's start with imagination because what is imagination? It's like a great big cloud that goes all over the place. Idudu, let's start with you. In your view, imagination, your personal imagination is shaped by what? I can't help feeling that one's background, one's experience, education, but don't put words into your mouth into your mouth, unmute yourself and tell us what shapes your imagination. Tell us about your imagination. 
Um, I mean, I guess you're right. Uh, you know, when you talk about childhood and and life and what one has experienced. My, I mean, I grew up in the villages and I now have lived in the city for, I guess, close to kind of an equal time. So my writing is, is both about the sense of childhood in the villages and the sense of being in the city. And so I often kind of use the same memories I have of growing up in the village to write about the city. Um, and I do the same with adult life that I've lived in the city as an adult and yet somehow, you know, I kind of superimpose this kind of adult life in the city with a life in the villages. And so my imagination comes from that, I think. But it also comes from reading. So it comes from reading other authors. It comes from watching films. It comes from seeing photographs. And so parts, so that's where mine comes from. And, and this kind of, and I think reading as a writer really opens up to what kind of imagination you can come up with. and. And often sometimes you have to come up with this kind of crazy stuff that you have to you have to come up with to take their characters through. But it's also important, I guess, once you start writing characters or start writing a story, that you also entertain the possibilities of where these characters can go, which maybe as the author you've never gone. And, and that's important to kind of have this ear to your characters about where they want to go and what they want to do. And, and that forms part of the imagination that I work with. Mm. That's that's really interesting. Um, I, I love it that you grow, you can grow your imagination, you can feed your imagination, because it's it's not something you're necessarily well. You are born with it, but it's it's kind of limited when you start out. But it's something that you can you can keep it like going to a gym. You know, you can keep sort of piling it on and, and get your your imagination light and fit and strong. And again, that leads me to um, this thing about memory and imagination. Your experience, your background experience fuels your imagination but is there then a very blurred line between memory and imagination when you're writing you you've got a nice big fat imagination because you you've been using it a lot but do you feel that your memory plays a great role in your imagination um yeah, yes indeed uh, um, um i think to maybe if you allow me let me just maybe take uh, two steps back um, and, and, and just qualify my earlier answer that I gave you. Um, and the intention was not to say that writing or art is irrelevant in, you know, in states of conflict or, or what have you. I'm just saying that I think that with all the cumulative human knowledge in various disciplines, um, whether it be in politics, in diplomatic affairs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of which the writer is, you know, a conduit or a mirror to transmit and reflect those ideas. Um, it becomes a bit of a, um, I think maybe wishful thinking, that's the phrase, to think that art in and of itself would be able, uh, yes, it can illuminate those circumstances, but it wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, stop some of the things that are excesses in human interaction. Because if that were true, we would not have had uh, bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they were after the Second World War and have to deal with exactly the same existential threats that we have uh, now currently with the current conflict that's going on. And um, I think that I wouldn't be that careless with words and ideas to discard it with such extremes. But to answer your, your current question more uh, directly on memory and, 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 and imagination, I think that they are, you know, they are an integrated whole because they feed off each other. And I think that one's worldview and life experiences, as Lynn has said, uh, actually point you in different directions, even though you might not really, at the time, be consciously aware of all of them at any given time. So I think for me, um, imagination, my imagination works a little bit differently in that um, if I sit and I'm just conscious of myself as a person, some of these things just get gifted to me in ways that um, would be very difficult to explain uh, to people. 
I just know where things should go, uh, where they fit. And um, it, it might sound a little bit cheesy, but that's, that's what happens. Hmm. The gifting is a very interesting um, addition to, to what we've been discussing because I, we haven't really talked about it, but, you know, there's also the issue of the muse, you know, how many people say, you know, just sort of wait for the muse to arrive and then the, the writing happens. And a lot of people poo poo that idea, you know, the muse never comes, you know, you just have to keep going and eventually the muse will arrive. But the idea of gifting, um, I'm sure, is quite a key one because there is some sort of magic that happens when you start to write and things do arrive unbidden, yeah. you know, even going back to the memory, even memories that may have been buried, that you may have forgotten all sorts of things that may emerge as a result of your writing. Do you find that that happens? Sure. No, indeed. I think you've hit the, name, uh, the nail on the head. Um, and I think the point we shouldn't lose is that different people are very, um, you know, different in the way that they approach, uh, approach artistic practice and a lived artistic life. So what works for one uh, painter is, uh, might not work for the next. And, and that's why in the whole wild world with all the music, uh, uh, sea of music that exists in the world, there are no two guitarists that are the same. There's a reason for that. Uh, in that the orientation and the different instincts from art, one artist to the next are, are very, very different. They might be complementary, but they are not necessarily from the same source or the same intensity. Mm. Yes, lots of lots of things there that we could discuss. But Lynn, I want to come back to you and imagination. Um, you know, we've seen that the, the line between imagination, memory, experience, it's kind of blurred. These things are all part of the same package. But the Im imagination can be a very elusive thing. And I wonder to myself, you know, sometimes if you're driving along, you're in the shower, or walking the dog or whatever it is you're doing, you might think, oh, I've got this. Are, are you a notebook person? Do you, when these things sort of hit you like a flash of lightning, do you write it down, or, or, you know, and then wait? Do you have a sort of little portmanteau that you walk around with and then all these things come out when you need them? How do you work? Uh, um, I've been keeping notebooks all my life, but to Lidudu and, and to, to the point, when you're writing, when I wrote the novel, I was so obsessed with it that it would actually be with me. In fact, Wanda, the character, would come out of me because um, she's a kind of slightly larger than life character. And I go, where did that come from? So um, put, put it this way, had I had a really nice mommy and daddy and lived in one town all my life, this book would never have been written. But because I could... I've always believed, well, not always believed, I believe since I've written that if you can almost alchemize experience into, through imagination, actually into fiction, I'm not so interested now in memoir, I, I respect it, but without the, the transformation, I think from through memory and experience into imagination, it wouldn't have fulfilled my need to have elevated my abilities actually to have and, and, and I mean I, I look at it now and I go where the hell did that come from so I like the the obsessive compulsive disorder in a way that comes with the writing and it's it's taking me to another place in my life into my dreams so I write my dreams down a lot into if you like psychoanalytic theory which I've been very involved with, into my musical ability which has also contributed to this so to me it's um I do, yes, I can write down little thoughts here and there, but it's actually sitting down at the typewriter and bleeding, as our old Hemingway would say, to sit down at the desk and do the next part, whether you're inspired, whether you're tired. Um, I've lost a little bit of that routine now, which I, which I desperately need to, to re recover. Um, I don't, you can't just write when you're inspired. Um, mm, and, yeah, and, and no, yet no, it is the spark without which you can't do anything. So I don't know mm. if that answers you, yeah. Well, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. It just opens up yet another yet another avenue. I feel we're sitting here in the, the center of this road where there are all these avenues up which we could be going. Um, but interesting, you talk about your own dreams, interrogating all this stuff that's inside you and your head. And I'm thinking about Ndi Keng, um, I haven't read it yet, but the discovery of love, you get into the, into the heads and dreams and bodies and minds 
of other people. And I think that is requires, maybe you need to be a psychologist or a medic or something to be, to, to sort of put yourself into somebody else's space, mind space. But okay, let's just, come back just, to- Okay, just, yeah, just a 30 yeah. second quick thing is because this yeah, was written as an autobiographical fiction or a fictional autobiography, my, my, my challenge to myself now, and I'm doing a PhD in short story with David Medali, is to move into other people's um, points of view. And, and that's the big challenge for me now, because it's all very well that I've got this character who went through 2000 years of history. And now how do you write a short story from a snail's point of view, from, I don't know, a lesbian nun's point of view. I, it, it's That's my new challenge is to go into other people's headspace. Yeah. Good luck with the lesbian nun. <laughs> but a lot but of experience with lesbian nuns actually. Yes. But it, it, it opens up what Garth was saying about the power of story, um, you know, the power of telling your story, your own story, uh, which is beneficial for the storyteller as much as it may be for the person who's reading it and receiving it. Um, you do want to come back to you because I feel we need to obey what we've been asked to do, which is talk about imagination, recognition and success. I'm going to leave success to the end because it's such a difficult word because who can measure success? Everybody will have a different uh, idea of what that looks like, what that feels like. But let's look at recognition. You do, do. It's interesting that you um, have been, you were awarded the uh, Moreland, I've lost it now here, the Miles Moreland Scholarship, which, in a, which was a recognition in itself. I think you had to apply, but you were recognized. What, what for you, how important is recognition for you? Uh, is it important that your mum or daddy or friends or your colleagues recognize what you do? What does recognition mean to you? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a difficult question because I, I, I think I, I mean, there's certainly a, a kind of thing that when you create work that, you know, there's, there's something in me that hopes that even if it finds just one enthusiastic reader who reads it over and over again, that for me would mean a lot. And so I, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't, I mean, I guess there's a difference with writing for validation, right? I don't write for validation. I write the stories that I want to write, but I am excited every time anyone reads anything I write because it, it falls off on that the, the things that I obsess about and write in my little table at home that I am completely obsessed with, someone else finds it somehow interesting to read and that's important. But the kind of the kind of recognition, I guess, from the Miles Mullen Foundation or from any other award, is is interesting in a way because I I think that it's great to get those things, but I certainly don't need them to continue writing, and I th I think without them I would still continue to tell the stories that I tell, and and so. I mean, it's very much an encouragement to get those things that anyone cares about this little story that you want to write. But I certainly don't think it, it will ever stop me from writing. But it might, if it were negative recognition. I go back to what, was it you, Garth, who was using the old Irish, and it is in fact St. Patrick's Day today, you were using the old Irish term of crap. I mean, if somebody says to you, well, you know, or they maybe they say to your friend or somebody else, you know, and I read his book, I thought it's a load of rubbish. Um, if you were to be party or if you were yeah, to receive yeah. that, um, Garth, how would it make you feel? You know, because recognition can be good or bad. Doesn't necessarily mean, wow, aren't they wonderful? Well, I think we, we're all human and um, being told what you've written is crap is, is probably not terribly lovely for anyone. Um, I mean, I had one review, which was it was so bad and so scathing that it was almost funny. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've never met the reviewer, but it really was a character assassination of note, um, which was actually quite nice because it was so vitriolic that actually it was funny. Um, so, sort of thinking, you know, I, I often feel like if you, don't, if you don't elicit emotion in what you do, either positive or negative, you, want, you might as well not bother because you're not actually making a statement about anything in the world. So. Um, sometimes negative emotion is is a reaction. So um, you know, for, for me, the the strangely the because my sort of career has been around health and social change, uh, the, the most surprising part of 
response to to my book was that I I do talk a bit about uh, being able to talk around mental illness and around uh, the fact that I've struggled with anxiety and depression for many years and uh, have been highly medicated for the protection of the masses. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the number of men who contacted me, a uh, number of people who said how brave it was to actually talk about these things. I mean, that for me actually was really good because I had, you know, if nothing else, I had first of all given some men the permission to actually say, you can be reasonably successful and be, as I call it, stuffed in the head. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's fine, you know. And so one of my une unexpected things that I took recognition from was um, the fact that people, particularly men, found the fact that I'd spoken about anxiety and depression and medication uh, very liberating for them. So that for me yeah. was success. Yeah, that, that talks a little bit to conscience and messaging, which we probably won't get to. But, you know, does one write to affect change, to, to open people's minds to all sorts of other things? Um, that's really interesting. Just a quick one. I, mean, I just want it's to just add different. quickly as well. Go, go. Yeah. I, I mean, what Garth is talking about also is also this idea for me that reading is very subjective. And, and I think no reviewer reviews any book from a point that's not subjective. And so my, I mean, you know, people, not everyone likes my work and that's perfectly fine, you know. But the thing for me is that I'm not, I'm not writing for the applause and I'm not also gonna be hugely discouraged by people who don't like my work. I, I think in a way I am the first reader of my work. And I mean, there's one thing about a writer where you can talk with an editor and you can agree that, you know, this paragraph is really terrible. You don't need it. That's perfectly fine. But there's also a thing about once you've gone through drafts and drafts of writing and you absolutely think this paragraph matters in this book or, or in this story, no review of it that says it's crap will completely convince me that it shouldn't be there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a sort of a mixed blessing, isn't it? Briefly, Garth, did it hurt? Did it help this vitriolic review that you got? Um, well, it 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 didn't it didn't hurt. As I say, it was so it was so bad that it was almost laughable. I think yeah. if it had been more nuanced, I'd have probably taken it more seriously. And yeah. uh, and the I think the fact that it was balanced out also by a lot more positives than negatives uh, also put it into perspective. Um, but um, it was, as I say, I, I, it was the only thing I could say was it was amusing. It was so vitriolic. So mm, <laughs> it, yeah. I, flip. I don't well, know. I, I don't I know where it's... this person is, but boy, oh boy, have they got an axe to grind with me. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully they're listening. So whoever you were, <laughs> I don't know. I don't... You know. It didn't work. I uh, no, it didn't work. <laughs> well, I don't. Maybe I'm just too too doff or dumb to to take that stuff on, but. Yeah, but it was placed it's, it's, in perspective, uh, you know, as I said. Um, it, it, it grew you in one way or another, you know, because... One, no, one I don't like that get... word, this, this concept oh, okay. of growth. No, this thing about we, we go through hard times and that grows us. I've had enough growing for six lifetimes. No, it didn't grow me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look pretty good, for, you, you, you've survived. Um, and to Ken, I can't remember exactly what it said, but I read a message on your Facebook thread and somebody, a reader had contacted you, and I, I don't know if you can remember it, but they said something about um, reading your work, and and you, they said, was this you? And you said, yes, this is me. Can Am I making any sense here? Do you remember that? Yeah, no, it was a, a, a reader who said they recognized, well, it was a she, who said she recognized herself in my, what in small things, my novel. And I, you know, I had to, you know, it starts very polite and, you know, you explain that it is not you. I can promise you if there's anyone who would know positively, absolutely for certain 100%, if it was you or not, it would be me as the creator of the work. Um, but uh, to this day, the person is convinced that it's them in, 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 in my book, uh, which uh, for one, the royalties to paint, okay, I'm telling. 
<laughs> yeah so 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 which 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 for me doesn't really um i think th there needs to be creative distance between the um artwork and its reading public or the social context where the work finds itself and i don't think that um personally i want to be entangled too much into um the feedback that i receive for my work whether good or bad uh, because um, both of them, if it's overly optimistic and praiseworthy and what have you, that has got an effect too. Um, and, and I think that every sensible thinking person would want um, the work that uh, they do to have some resonance to people that are reading. I think that it would be very disingenuous to say, I don't care completely what happens and what doesn't happen, because I don't think that would be sincere or be true. But be that as it may, um, with um, the sort of um, unexpected or overly negative uh, things that uh, can emanate from someone interacting with, with, with work, I think the responsibility of an artist speaking for myself is just to respect that viewpoint and move on and let, and not let it define your work or uh, sensitize you to where to to areas that are not in your natural um, calibration um your 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 passion i think i you mentioned um small things again very interesting collection of answers that you've given us there. In fact, if anybody has any questions that they would like to, anybody listening on Facebook or wherever would like to pose, please do, because I see we've just got about 10 minutes left and lots more to say. We haven't even started on success, but that might be quite brief, I'm thinking. Um, and again, you mentioned small things then, and I noticed that on small things, I think it was J.M. Quitsia who did a shout um, for that book. Am I right? Uh, yes, absolutely correct. Yeah. So what does what, what is that? Because, you know, I'm thinking about recognition that you get from friends and family and readers and booksellers and, you know, all sorts of people. But when you get recognition from another writer, certainly one of, uh, of his stature, I believe he's just turned 80 years old. What does that mean? What, was he, did you, um, did you solicit a, a shout from him? Was it spontaneous? How did that work? And what did it make you feel? Well, it was solicited and it seemed like a, a long shot, um, so to speak. Um, and when it did happen at the end of the day, as someone whose work I had uh, read and admired um, over a long time, um, it was very uh, reassuring and it places a some level of responsibility in the work that you do, because I believe that um, the arts in general and writing in particular is one continuous stream of consciousness. And I've been fortunate that my, 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 my novels have been endorsed by, you know, uh, people that are considered to be masters in, 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 in what they do. And it's not something that I take for granted because I open myself up so that I'm able to learn something from them. I think it would be dangerous to believe that, you know, just because you're able to, to, to write um, that you don't have much to learn either from reading or just from, you know, a collaborative engagement with people that might know a few things that you don't. Yes, I think you're opening yourself up is a very good phrase because being a writer, you make yourself incredibly vulnerable because whatever you put on that page, that is you and you are, you're bearing your soul one way or another. And I just wanted to talk quickly about the life and times of Michael Cabe with reference to your book with James uh, Kutsia's book as well. I recently saw the production, The Life and Times of Michael Kay, uh, with the Handspring Puppet Company. And if ever anybody has an opportunity to see it, it is a breathtaking production. Absolutely amazing. It's really, really something. Um, Lynn, talking of shouts on books, I think you, my dear, got a shout from Stephen Fry, qui moi, um, which was not half bad. Was again, was that, in fact, he said, just what the world needs now, a novel change with mute charge, with music energy bounce, <laughs> juice and joy. Did, was it solicited? How did that happen? I, how, did it make you feel good? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did reach out. 
he was extremely and is still extremely generous with his praise. And had that not happened, I'm not sure how the trajectory of my own sense of succeeding would have worked because if Stephen likes it, really, you know, I, I know some people have been defeated by the novel. They've told me particularly and ironically, some of my um, people of, of the Hebraic persuasion, as I would call it. Um, so with the, the, in fact, and, and the shot I reached out to him for happened as the book was going into publication. So I still, I still have to, you know, smack myself to believe that it's actually happened. He's, we've remained in contact, which is another thing for the guys to say, you know, it's, it, it was a one-off wonder, <laughs> but it's actually, I've, I've reached out to him with the uh, audio book that I'm writing. He's given me very good advice. Um, I, I say to any writer that you've got nothing to lose by asking. And he's been the most generous, menschiest amazement. So, but then on the other hand, there are people who think it's an absolute lot of crap and that's also fine. So you, you kind of calibrate between the greatest Jewish, British comedian on earth thinks that, and he's in love with wonder. You see, this is the other thing. He's in love with the character. He doesn't know who I am. So, so as such, so the fact that he, he can acknowledge me as an author is secondary to the fact that he loves the character and and we've had a lot of discussion about how it ties in with history and how it ties in with the wife of bath you know so so you know and i i run up to my husband and say steve fried and he says who's who's that said my husband so you know it, it, it i think to, to what the guys were saying you have to understand it within yourself that the success was actually having it literally out there in the world the rest is yeah. actually beyond your control but stephen fry will be my fairy godfather for the rest of my life <laughs> Yes, I'm thinking um, there's a, a line, a phrase which is probably Yiddish, um, those that matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter. So, you know, you want the people to recognize you to be the people who matter to you. And that's what matters. We have just a very few minutes left. So we really do have to talk about success. And I wonder, Yudu, you seem to be the go-to guy for starting off these conversations in, in a very few words or minutes or thoughts how do you define success as a writer perhaps or how do you define success yeah. i mean at its simplest level for me i guess it's sitting down and and being able to get up and i have written at least one good sentence how very humble of you. So you don't expect, you're not looking for the Ferrari, you're not looking for, you know- I would accept it, to... yes, but I'm not <laughs> looking for it. <laughs> but it's not, going, it's, not going to, it's not going to motivate you. Can, so can, I, I, just, can, I, yes. can I just pop in there and I say, I say, Lidudu, agree, but it's that one good sentence that when you read three months later is still that one good sentence. In other words, the ability to sustain your self-belief that that is where it resonated for you. Yeah. Yes, yes, and that all those months later, you don't think this is a lot of crap. It seems to be the word of the conversation. <laughs> um, there, is, Garth, there is a phase of that, though. There's yeah. always a phase of that's the biggest load of crap I've ever read. Don't you Garth, think? How, how, do you, how do you define success? Um, well, success was actually seeing this, uh, you know, actually uh, arrive in print. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> And uh, just um, no, I, I think I, I've, I've alluded to it. Is that I I wrote this for a very specific reason, and it has already been meaningful for some people, and that for me is is success. So um, I had sort of got my eye on a yacht with two helipads, and now I've downgraded to only one helipad because the okay. sails are not going to <laughs> are not going to um, cover the second helipad. So I suppose if, if after this webinar or whatever it is, you know, we just get a massive boost in sales, then I will add the second helipad to, to the yacht. There you go. There you go. Well, I don't have a copy. I have read it, but I don't have a copy of it. Uh, in fact, Cindy Wimagona lent me your book, and I was very proud to have her book that she lent me. Um, and I, I wish you every success. Maybe Thank it'll you get no. you a just must to Cindy has, to has got to be my one of the unheralded icons of this country. She is quite phenomenal. Is she and not I wish truly... more people. I wish more people would read her books, and she is. She's one of my heroines. Yeah, I wish her many helipads. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. And Deking, success. How would you define it? Um, I 
define it with um, at, in, at a very anatomical sort of level. Uh, for me, writing is about choosing. And uh, for me, success is the choice of the right word, not even at the sentence yet or at the phrase yet. So for me, out of all the vocabulary that we have, I feel and believe that I am successful at the first level at the choice of the right word. Secondly, is a sentence that is properly written. Thirdly, is a sentence that sings. Fourth, whatever I have written has to have an ability to make me feel and appreciate something. And I am ultimately successful when, when I sign off the, the, the manuscript, uh, post edit, I sleep well at night and not have one question mark in my mind. And if I was hit by a bus the next day, um, I'll be a happy, happy, happy ghost knowing that there was not a comma that would move out of place. That for me is success. What happens after that, I try not to worry about. Gosh, we've spoken with much humility and somewhere I read about you or a quote that you said, you said the world is but a fleeting feast of sonic and visual clues. I thought, oh, such wow. a good line. Lovely. Lynn, yeah. success means what to you? I wouldn't want to say what the boys said. Um, we have no control over what happens once it leaves our desk. I've always been told this about copywriting, but more so whether it, my name was misspelt in the exclusive books, it, you know, whether Stephen Fry loved it, whether my Jewish friends were defeated. The, the fact that it actually, as Gar said, this, this is a success that it's out in the world. I hope to continue and, and following that to say, to choose the right word, the right sentence, to be able to sit down again and bleed because it's not a competition. You can't compare yourself to anyone else. It's actually a self comparison. And I hope to be able to succeed within myself. It's almost a self belief. I think that, that I would define it by, but what, what all the guys said as well. Mm. Lovely. I think you're all very, you know, we all have great humility. We have a question. Um, I imagine it's for you, Garth. Where can we get your books to help Garth sustain his lifestyle? So, um, Garth, your book, it's available in all bookshops, yeah? Like Water Yeah, and, and it's not to sustain my lifestyle. It's to create my lifestyle. Okay, this is to the get lifestyle. the success. Well, I, it's the lifestyle that I want, which is the yacht and the two helipads. But it's not what I have right now. So, um, yeah, say, and loot and exclusive mm. and... Uh, Kindle and Amazon and all of those things, uh, thanks to the publishers. Yeah, I don't, I don't I just see you as a yachtsman. You're Nancy, not a big oligarchy uh, about you. Yes. Then anybody who thinks that they're writing for financial success needs to disabuse themselves of that notion immediately. It is that is not the purpose. That is not the motivation. That's not the reward either. Just so. Uh, pity, pity. Yes. Sorry, yes. God, but I, I, I'll be mooring my boat next to yours. <laughs> harbor. Sorry, dog. <laughs> no, that's why that's why I have such great respect for my colleagues here who make a living out of this. It's it really is a labor of love and a huge respect to my colleagues on this on this webinar. Well, I have huge respect for you all, and I hope that this has been recorded because I think there have been some absolute gems of of opinion and ideas and concepts, and I I, I think it's been really rich and fertile. Um, I'm just going to steal another minute. You know, you talk about other writers, and there are probably a lot of people listening who themselves would like to be a writer. They're maybe an aspirant, maybe a beginner writer, maybe even an established writer. Would you have one, one word, maybe two, very brief um, bit of advice for them? Did you do? Read and write. Read and write. Good, good, good. Don't get more honest than that. Garth? I'll go with Ledudu on that. And you can. Be Advice? conscious. Be Sorry? conscious. Be conscious. Be conscious. Be conscious. Be conscious. Then. Structure and discipline. Structure and discipline. So read and write, read and write. Be conscious, structure and discipline. With that, I want to say thank you so much. It's been an absolute treat and a joy. And thank you very much 
for sharing your thoughts. And I've no doubt that we will perhaps meet on the book circuit, the wonderful book circuit, again sometime very soon. Thank you, Nancy. Bless you all. Very best of luck with all the books still to come, the helicopters still to come, and have the rest, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, the time of the writer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is success. This is <laughs>